Across YouTube and live from the History Roadshow Studios in London. Welcome to the live stream with your host, John Marshall. Hey, everybody, how are we all doing? <laughs> it's uh, it's what a, what a great introduction. Morgan Freeman, Floating Special, is in the green room that way. I think he's having a coffee at the moment. Anyway, welcome, everybody. I was thinking today, it's about, uh, about two years since I last did one of these, so it's uh, it's an all new beginning, if you like, uh, uh, something uh, I've not done for quite a while, and uh, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm excited though, don't get me wrong. So let's see who we've got so far. Rochelle, good evening Rochelle, I'm glad you're excited. Uh, time foolery, hello friend, uh, you're from uh, Vancouver, uh, so probably mid-afternoon for you at the moment over there. Uh, we've got Medieval Maiden, she's in Newcastle, hello Medieval, uh, who else have we got, Anita, hello John, hello Anita, nice to see you, and Grace is waving, hello Grace, a little wave for you too. Right, so, tonight, hopefully, I'm going to get through my little talk in about 30, 40 minutes maybe, and of course, I'm sure you're all aware of what it's about, uh, the, the princes in the tower. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts as the evening progresses. And I'll take some short breaks as well every now and again to catch up uh, with what you're all saying in the chat. And of course, some shout outs to people joining. Like we've just got Anna May, uh, who's in New York. Hello, Anna May. How's New York? The Big Apple. And Ella H. She's in, uh, I think that's, I think that's Austria. So she'll be, uh, I'm guessing you've got a lot of snow over there then. There'll be uh, plenty of skiing and stuff going on in Austria this evening. Well, maybe not this evening, but tomorrow and over the weekend. So, let's get started uh, on one of the most interesting, intriguing and complex stories from history. It's a tale that has no ending. It's a yarn that you really can't make up. Yet it's a story that still resonates with people to this day. What started as a 15th century what happened is now a 21st century who done it. Was it just a case of moving these boys out of sight and mind, never to be recorded again? Or more than that, was it murder? Well, at the end of this, none of us will still know for sure, but uh, for some of the ideas, they make you rethink about who you thought was really behind the princess in the tower. Now, to start tonight, I've put together 
as I normally do when I do the when I've done these live streams in the past, I also include a few clips to help tell the story and give you a little bit of background as well uh, to all the uh, to all the history going off. So uh, I created th this one is from a video I created some time ago, so it'll hopefully set the mood and it'll open up the show uh, with the intro to the princes in the tower. On the 9th of April 1483 is where our story begins. A look back in time at a medieval mystery. A mystery that remains unsolved even to this day. With the death of King Edward IV, he'd left behind two sons, Edward aged 12 and Richard just nine. Both boys were put under the protectorship of Edward's brother Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. But lurking in the shadows was his sworn enemy, Henry Tudor, a man who posed a massive threat. It's a tale of terror that leads us to the Tower of London, once the home of monarchs in England at that time. It's a battle for survival, a tale of intrigue, of kidnap and murder. But who are the suspects and what was the motivation behind the internment of these boys? Join me now as we look at the story of the princes in the Tower. Well, there you go. There's a little uh, intro to uh, what we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, I will get back to your messages every now and again, uh, but I'm going to crack on with the uh, the main story now. So thanks initially to everybody who's uh, tuned in. I think we've got uh, 20, 26 viewers at the moment, which is more than I ever dreamed about. But anyway, let's crack on. Um, 9th of April, 1483, England's throne gets rocked with King Edward IV unexpectedly biting the dust, and his young son, Edward V, is suddenly the big name in charge. But here's where the plot thickens. Richard, Duke of Gloucester and the late King's brother, is holed up in Middleham Castle. Now, he does the honourable thing, or so it seems, pledging his loyalty to the new king at York Minster. But now Edward IV had a dying wish for Gloucester to be the guardian of the realm and the Lord Protector. But the big shots on the Privy Council, they're not having it, and no one's bound to follow a dead king's last ask, are they? Edward IV trusted his brother Richard to do the right thing. Richard even swore an oath to protect his nephews. However, things were now moving at pace. On the 16th of June, Edward was joined by his younger brother Richard at the Tower. On the 22nd of June, a sermon by Dr Ralph Shaw, who was brother to the Lord Mayor, proclaimed that Gloucester was the only legitimate heir to the House of York. By June the 25th, a group of knights and lords declared that Gloucester should take the throne. Both princes were then declared illegitimate by Parliament. They also stated that the marriage of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville was invalid due to a pre-contract made with Lady Eleanor Butler. On the 3rd of July, Gloucester was crowned King Richard III. At this point, the boys were still looked upon as royalty, but soon that would change and they would become prisoners. Right, on April the uh, 29th, Edward V and Gloucester are en route to London after they stop over at uh, a place called Stony Stratford. Now here comes a twist. Gloucester arrests all of Edward's entourage, including his own nephew and stepson. And spoiler alert, those guys don't get a happy ending. Gloucester grabs the young prince, which freaks out the dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville. Excuse me. So that she uh, hightails it into sanctuary with her other kids. Now, the young King Edward V should be prepping for his big coronation day, uh, but oh dear, there's a delay. And where do the boys end up staying? Well, of course, in the infamous Tower of London. But wait, there's more. A sermon goes viral declaring Gloucester the only legit heir of the York family. Talk about a public relations spin. The next thing we know is Parliament is calling the royal children illegitimate because of some supposed pre-wedding promise that their dad made, basically annulling their parents' marriage posthumously. This means Gloucester hits the ultimate jackpot and he's crowned King Richard III. Now some folks say that declaring the princes illegitimate was just a way to make Gloucester's rise to the throne look kosher. But this story's got more layers than a royal wedding cake and you've got to admit, it's got intrigue written all over it. So there, that's where we are at the moment. I'm just going to stop and we'll take a few breaks tonight because I do obviously 
want to keep on touch of uh, your messages and things like that. Uh, Anna May, she said it's cold in Austria. Yeah, I gathered that. <laughs> Looking good, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Medieval Maiden. Medieval Maiden, I better say all. Um, hello from California, Elizabeth. Hello, California. California, or uh, however you say it's over there. Grace, ironically, didn't Richard III's DNA prove his father may have been someone else? We're going to get to the DNA later on, Grace. So pin back your ears, as we say, and uh, we'll carry on. <laughs> the next part of uh, this uh, talk basically is about the disappearance itself. So there is the background. There, there was the background to the story. I'm going to now, as I said, talk about the disappearance of the boys and uh, some, some of the accounts as well. So let's take a look into what happened and let's tackle a real head scratcher today. The evidence, or should I say the almost non-existent evidence about the fate of the princes in the tower. Now this is a topic that's truly in a league of its own because frankly, we've got next to nothing. Their sudden disappearance is about as concrete as it gets. And no one's found a smoking gun to prove they were killed. As for the stories from back then, well, you've got to watch, um, watch out because they could be dripping with Tudor spin. Historians believe that the boys had been murdered. One suggestion is that a rebellion against Richard in 1483 was aimed at rescuing Edward V and his brother. However, the Duke of Buckingham became involved. And at that point, it looks pretty likely that both boys had already been murdered. The rebellion force, reluctant to take it any further at this stage, decided to support Henry Tudor in his quest to remove Richard III from power. Although the princes had vanished, there is no evidence to suggest they were murdered. Neither do the theories give a clear view of what happened. The nearest anyone can get to the truth is an account by the aforementioned Dominic Mancini, which, by the way, was not discovered until 1934 in Lille at the Municipal Library. Accounts written after the disappearance are spurious and quite possibly based solely on propaganda coming out of the House of Tudor. So there you go. There's a little bit of uh, background again on uh, what we're going to be talking about now. From this point on, it gets a little bit Indiana Jones, if that makes any sense. Four bodies dating from the same era have popped up. Now, two were hanging out in the Tower of London and another pair in St. George's Chapel at Windsor. Now, the Tower Tucson were moved to Westminster Abbey, but uh, here's the catch. The powers that be have shut down any DNA testing. Where is she? Who said DNA? Grace. There we are. We're getting on to it, Grace. Um, to see if they are, in fact, they are the uh, missing princes. But the game changed when Richard III's bones turned up under a parking lot of all places. And now we've got his DNA, which opens up the possibility of finally getting some answers. Yet the big question remains, will we get the go-ahead to use the DNA? Under Queen Elizabeth, the door was firmly closed. She believed the dead deserved their peace and not a poke from a science stick. But now with King Charles wearing the crown, could there be a change in heart? And could we see a royal nod for a DNA deep dive? So I suggest we stick around as this historical puzzle might just get a new piece of evidence in the years to come. But for now, we're stuck with what we have, which, as I said, is next to nothing. Apart from their mysterious vanishing, there's no concrete evidence that the princes were murdered, and accounts of the time are either biased or influenced by Tudor propaganda. So let's peek into the rumour mill of the 15th century, because let me tell you, it was churning out stories like nobody's business after the princes in the tower pulled their Houdini out. Rumours of the tragedy have constantly circulated, from their time of disappearing to the modern day, and some have even travelled across the Channel to France. It would be in January of 1484 that Guillaume de Rochefort, the Lord Chancellor of France, urged the Estates General to take warning from the fate of the princes, as their king, Charles VIII, was only 13. Many at the court believe that Richard III killed them before seizing the throne in England, but in a book entitled The De Comin Memoir, around 1500, it states that the Duke of Buckingham was the real culprit. So there we go. Now keep in mind that most of this buzz comes years after the fact. In fact, it was 17 years 
and by then Richard III was six feet under, and Henry VII was calling the shots. But Dominic Mancini was on the ground, scribbling away his account, right there in London, all before November 1483. Now here's the thing, an historian named Markham, who didn't even have Mancini's notes when he was doing his research, speculated that some of these tales, like the Croyland Chronicle, might have been cooked up or at least spiced up by none other than John Morton, who at the time was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And why? Well, to throw Richard III under the bus, or possibly not a bus, maybe a horse and cart, as it would have been in those days. But now history isn't just a web of truths, half-truths and crafty storytelling. Now I'm interested in your thoughts tonight, so on this dilemma, uh, and uh, if there's anything you've got to say about it or I'd like to add to the discussion, feel free. The next thing we're going to be looking at is into the bodies that were found, uh, but were they the ones of the boys? Now, quick uh, rundown here of some of these messages. Jane is uh, in Missouri. Hello, Jane, one of our uh, channel members. Good evening, Jane. Thanks for joining. Uh, Duchess of Doom, hello. Welcome. I think that's a good good name, actually, for tonight. Duchess of Doom, because it's a bit of a Doom story, this one, isn't it? Uh, evening from Ella, or we've seen... Uh, I think we've spoke to Ella. Have we spoke to Ella? Uh, Daughter of Patriots, Pennsylvania. Good evening, Pennsylvania. Nice to have you along. Afeni Braun, a big hello from Hungary. Good evening to uh, the people over there in Hungary. Uh, and I think... We've just about caught up for the meantime. So let's crack on. A little bit more to get through, just uh, uh, still still to uh, get through, right, rather. I'm getting my tongue twisted. Um, as I said, the next part now, we're going to start looking at uh, the uh, where the bodies uh, that turned up and a little bit more information about that. So it seems we've got a real historical whodunit on our hands that takes us back to the summer of 1674. I imagine this. Workmen are at the Tower of London doing a big renovation job when they stumble upon a wooden box buried deep, well, about 10 feet under a staircase. Inside, the skeletons of two children. Now, these weren't the first children's bones found in the tower, but these particular items, uh, these particular remains had people talking because of where they were found. It was sort of like a scene out of a thriller, matching up with the old tale from Thomas More. Thomas More said that the princes were smothered in their beds by two people who were agents of Tyrrell. One was Miles Forrest and the other John Dighton. More claims that the bodies were buried at the foot of some stairs, deep into the ground and covered with stones, yet later disinterred and moved to a secret location. However, this does not match, as the staircase where these bones were found was not built at the time of Richard III. Four years after the discovery, Charles II had the bones placed in an urn and reinterred at Westminster Abbey, within the wall of Henry VII Lady Chapel. A monument was erected by Christopher Wren, marking the resting place of the assumed princes. In 1933, these bones were removed and examined by Lawrence Tanner, an archivist at the time, Professor William Wright, anatomist, and George Northcroft, who was president of the Dental Association. They concluded that they were, in fact, bodies of two small children, who would have been around the age of the princes when they disappeared. So there we go, a little bit of background there. So this is where now it really gets to uh, a CSI level intriguing. In 1933, as mentioned in that last clip, some top experts took a look at these bones, sizing them up and declaring that they matched the ages of the princes. But it was a messy scene. Animal bones were mixed in, there was some nails and bits and pieces were missing. Now critics say that the 1933 examination was all about trying to confirm they were princes without checking much else, like whether they were even male or female. And since then, even though there was a push to get some DNA action happening, the petition got cut short. So think about it, even if we could get DNA from those bones, and even if they were the princes, it still wouldn't solve the mystery of what took them out. It's a tale that's been haunting history for centuries, and it looks like the last chapter's still waiting to be written. So what do you think? Would you want the mystery solved, or is some history better left alone? Grace, Thomas More story. I'll just have a quick drink, yeah? <clears throat> so 
So what we're going to do next is um, have a quick look at uh, where these first two bodies were found uh, and uh, at St. George's, uh, uh, St. George's Chapel in Windsor. Our following location is St. George's Chapel, Windsor. In 1789, workers were carrying out repairs when they accidentally broke into the vault containing Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. At the time, a small adjoining vault was spotted, and within that, another two bodies were found. They both seemed to harbour the bones of small children, yet both were unidentifiable, and no examination was carried out, and the tomb was resealed. Now, this tomb had two names, uh, had names of two of Edward IV's other children who sadly passed away young, written all over it. But then, in a plot twist during some renovations for King George III's final resting place, they found two lead coffins with those same children's names on them, but elsewhere in the chapel. Fast forward to the 1990s. And there's more work happening around King Edward IV's tomb. Now they're switching out an old boiler, making space for future deans and canons of Windsor. And someone pitches the idea, why not take another look into those vaults? Maybe use a fibre optic camera or actually examine these uh, two unidentified coffins that were bumped into way back when. But here's the deal, to crack open a royal tomb, you need the thumbs up from royalty. And the decision was that was to uh, let sleeping mysteries lie, and it was agreed to be left at least for a few more generations. Now, with all the buzz from that archaeological dig in Leicester in 2012, people now are curious again about the two princes, and could we find out more about them? Well, Queen Elizabeth, however, wasn't too keen on disturbing royal restings, and just when you think the case is closed, along comes King Charles III, now, rumour has it he might see things a bit differently and maybe even give the green light to finally solving this royal riddle. So what do you think? Should we be dusting off those history books ready to write a new chapter? Or is it best to let the past stay buried? Got any, uh, any new comments coming through? I don't think so at the moment. So we will continue. What we're going to look at next are the theories uh, and theories behind really the main three uh, protagonists, I guess, or the contenders for the title of uh, murderer, or maybe not. Who knows? But that's what we're going to have a look at next. So, um, as they say, the thing is, there's no smoking gun and there's no piece of ironclad evidence that tells us exactly what happened to these young royals which naturally has led to a slew of theories over the years. Now, the one that most folks lean towards is the idea that they were killed around the time they vanished from the scene. And a lot of historians, those who buy the murder theory, are still pointing their fingers at Richard III. So let's talk about Richard III. Well, many history buffs are pretty convinced that he's our guy, the one responsible for the prince's disappearance. You see, Richard's grip on the throne was anything but rock solid, thanks to the controversial way he snagged the crown, and that set a whole bunch of Yorkist bigwigs against him. But there was then the botched rescue operation to put Edward back on the throne, proving that as long as the princes were breathing, they were a beacon for anyone itching to start a rebellion. Whispers that the boys had met a grim fate were floating around by the end of 1483, Richard didn't parade them around to show that they were alive and well, which pretty much screams that they weren't. Still, he wasn't exactly quiet about it either. Raphael Hollingshead, back in 1577, wrote about how Richard was busy trying to convince everyone he hadn't done anything to his nephews, and he didn't even crack open a case to find out what happened to them, which, honestly, would have been a smart move if he had been innocent. The thing is, Richard wasn't even at court when the princes disappeared. He was off touring his strongholds. But the Tower of London, where the princes were kept, and that was under his control, and he had it locked down tight. If the boys had been murdered, it's hard to imagine that he didn't know about it. Then there's a the story that Sir James Tyrrell did the dirty work for Richard. 
Thomas More said Tyrrell admitted to it under torture right before he got the axe himself. And also William Shakespeare bought this version hook, line and sinker. And so do some modern historians. But here's a but, and it's a big but. The only record of Tyrrell's so-called confessions comes from More. No one's actually seen the original. AJ Pollard even wonders if More just made up the whole thing. And then there's Clements Markham, who threw a curveball, suggesting Henry VII was behind it all and got Tyrrell to confess by handing him a couple of of get-out-of-jail-free cards. But everyone back in the day, from George Selly to the Chancellor of France, seemed to think Richard had blood on his hands. Even Elizabeth Woodville, the princess's mum, seemed to buy it since she threw her support behind Henry Tudor when he made a move against Richard. And so here we are, centuries later, and the consensus hasn't changed much among historians. No one officially charged Richard with the crime, but Henry VII's bill of attainder against him was loaded with hints, accusing him him of shedding infant's blood, among other nasty deeds. So that's where we stand, folks. It's a royal mystery centuries old, with suspicions cast long ago that still shadow the legacy of Richard III. So what's your take on the royal riddle? Do we pin it on Richard, or does this historical who done it need a new prime suspect? It's time now to see who was potentially, who else was potentially behind the plot. Medieval maiden, she said, the disappearance of the princess is one of the greatest mysteries in history. A complicated case. You're very correct. Very right about that one. <clears throat> Grace, he snatched the crown. Remember Hastings? Yep. Uh, Hastings didn't last too long with uh, Richard around. That is a fact. Right, let's have a look at the next contender tonight, of course. The one, the only, Henry Tudor. So, this guy snatched the crown and he wasn't shy about knocking off a few threats to his new throne. Some whispers from the past suggest that uh, John of Gloucester, Richard III's illegitimate son, might have been on Henry's hit list. But here's the kicker. Henry was out of the country when the princes vanished and he didn't waltz back into England until August 1485. So if we're pointing fingers for the prince's demise, Henry could have only been the culprit after he plopped that royal crown on his head. So if it wasn't Richard, could it have been the orders of Henry? Now Henry did make a power move the year after he became king by marrying the prince's big sister, Elizabeth of York. A smart move, but he didn't want anyone doubting her right to be queen. And so he overturned this nasty piece of work called the titulus regis that labelled all the kids, including the princes, as illegitimate. And here's where it gets dicey. Suggestions have been made that Henry might have given the order to execute the princes sometime in the summer of 1486. And suddenly everyone starts gabbing that Richard III was the bad guy. But also did Henry muzzle the prince's mum, Elizabeth Woodville, by taking all her stuff and tucking her away in Bermondsey Abbey, where she eventually kicked the bucket. Yet many don't buy that account. It's said Elizabeth Woodville chose the Abbey life and that Henry was just covering his bases during a rebellion. And let's not forget, nobody back in the day openly accused Henry of murder, not even his enemies. So you'd think someone would have cried foul if they thought he had blood on his hands. Another remarkable statement was that if Henry had murdered the princes, he probably would have paraded their bodies around and pinned it on Richard with a crafty story. And lastly, let's not overlook what Raphael Hollings had said back in 1577, that Richard III proclaimed his innocence over the prince's murder. So I guess if it just doesn't add up that the princes were still kicking it with Uncle Richard for two whole years with everyone thinking they were with everybody else thinking that they were actually pushing up daisies. So was it Henry the Seventh with a late play, or is this just another red herring in a royal pond full of them? It's time to sift through the evidence and decide for ourselves. Rochelle, so far I'm still thinking Richard. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I think most people do actually, Rochelle. Uh, Carly Newton, hi Carly. I think Richard is much maligned by history, but I still have suspicions of his involvement with the princes. And, uh, yeah. Stay to the end, by the way, everyone, because uh, I've got a little surprise for you. So uh, that's all I'm saying at the moment. But, but I'll, I'll tell you in a bit. I'll tell you, I'll tell you shortly. Uh, okay, so the next contender is 
uh, this guy, the Duke of uh, Buckingham. Our third suspect was Richard's right-hand man, although Henry Stafford's guilt would depend on specific circumstances surrounding the event, as Henry himself was executed in November 1483. He had motives, being a descendant of Edward III on his father's side through John of Gaunt, the first Duke of Lancaster, along with Thomas of Woodstock, the first Duke of Gloucester, and the son of John of Gaunt, again called John, on his mother's side. Buckingham may have had hopes of becoming monarch himself over time, but Richard stood in the way for now. Yet Henry, who had rebelled against Richard, which led to his death, was quite possibly unhappy at Richard's orders to carry out the murders, and this swayed him in his loyalty to Richard. So did Henry, on orders from Richard, kill the princes? And we must also ask another question. If Henry had carried out the crime, why did Richard not openly talk about this to clear his own name from the proceedings? And for this reason alone, it's pretty positive Henry would never have carried out this act without Richard's collaboration. Now there's um, an old document from Portugal that points the finger at Buckingham, saying he basically starved the princess to death. And then there's this piece of paper from way later, found in the College of Arms in London, that bluntly says Buckingham was behind the murder. Now, Michael Bennett, he's another historian in this mix, he reckons maybe Buckingham and this other guy, James Tyrrell, might have jumped the gun and knocked off the princes without waiting for Richard's go-ahead. He points out that Richard left town, Buckingham was calling the shots in the capital, and they had a massive row later on, which really makes you think. Now, here's where it gets even juicier. Buckingham is... Um, now the only person besides Richard himself who gets named in the old records as a suspect. But it doesn't quite add up that he would have or could have acted solo. If Buckingham did the deed on his own, why didn't Richard throw him under the bus after Buckingham's rebellion went belly up? It would have been the perfect play to clear his own name. Plus the princes were locked tight in the tower. And Buckingham would have needed Richard's help to get at them. Jeremy Potter, one historian, argues that no one would have brought it, uh, bought it if Richard had tried to pin it on Buckingham. They all would have thought Richard was in on it too. Now this doesn't shut the door on Buckingham being involved. He might have been dreaming of wearing the crown himself and figured that knocking off the princes was step one. So what's your verdict? Was Buckingham the one, uh, the one with blood on his hands? Or was he just another piece of Richard's chessboard? The plot thickens and this historical drama isn't short. On suspects. John Howard, the first Duke of Norfolk, had been implicated. Margaret Beaufort was another, as Henry VII's mother, and even Jane Shaw, who was a mistress to Edward IV. But as with these and other theories, none can be taken seriously. The major stumbling block with any other but Richard carrying out the crime would have had to be done with Richard's order and knowledge, and the central fact is that Richard was responsible for the safekeeping of these boys. Now, as that clip suggests, there were other suspects for you to dwell on. Let's say more potential creative theories about the fate of the princes in the tower. We've got a lineup that includes John Howard, the first Duke of Norfolk, Margaret Beaufort, who was none other than Henry VII's mum, and even Jane Shaw, the well-known mistress of Edward IV. But one historian said we shouldn't waste our time. Why? Well, because all these accusations stumble over one major tripwire. How in the world could any of these folks have gotten their hands on the princes without Richard III catching wind of it? Remember, it was Richard's job to keep his nephew safe and sound in the Tower of London. Now, Margaret Beaufort's name has been tossed into the ring, but here's the thing, there's no hard evidence to uh, back up this claim. Just a what-if based on a possible motive. So as I walk you through this, keep in mind that these are more than just stretches. They're full-on leaps into the realm of speculation. So let's stay sharp and not get tangled up in these theories without the facts to back them up. Well, what little facts there are. So who, what, who, who, what? So what do you think any of these people are, uh, do you think any of these people are likely? Or is the evidence just plainly uh, dubious? Uh, and I think... Uh, Let's have a look. Elizabeth says, I'm reserving judgment until the end. 
Carly, I think Richard is much maligned by history, but I still have suspicions of his involvement with the princes. So there you go. Interesting stuff, guys. So what we're going to do now, to end uh, this talk, I don't, I've been going for about 35 minutes, uh, we're going to retrace some of the arguments. So let's unpack the tangled political drama surrounding the infamous disappearance of the princes. Everyone believed that these poor boys were murdered, and guess who got the blame? Richard. That's right, Richard III. Now, he may not have been the one holding the dagger, but since he was the one who dethroned them and kept them locked up, society back then pinned their welfare on him. People thought they were murdered, and bam, Richard's guilty in the court of public opinion. Richard killing his nephews wouldn't exactly have been a masterstroke for his reputation. However, murdering them may have made him more popular. Even when there was a rebellion to put Edward V back on the throne, rumours of the children's death didn't stop the rebels. They didn't give up, they just shifted their banners to rally behind Henry Tudor. Now if the princes had been around, choosing Tudor would have been a bad choice. So did Richard do the deed? Why did the Woodvilles jump on the back of the Tudor train? And what happened to the early backers of Richard? Did they leave him due to the chance they could be looking at a criminal regime? One thing is for certain, excuse me, Richard's power took a serious hit when these folks defected. He had to force his northern buddies into office in the south to keep a lid on things. And let me tell you that that move was about as popular as a skunk at a garden party. So to end, was Richard the bad guy history painted him? Or just the unluckiest king in the kingdom? Let's see what uh, theories we've got coming up at this point. Still got a little bit more to get through, by the way, so uh, stay tuned. And don't forget, I've got something a bit special for you at the end. Uh, let's have a look. An evil maiden, innocent or guilty, Richard III was responsible for the young princes. Yeah, I don't think anybody can disagree with that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, Grace, I think Richard's biggest, uh, Richard, the biggest suspect, he rearranged crowning Edward twice, Hastings and on. Oh yeah, I, I, know what you, I know where you're coming from, Grace. Um, now this last part of the talk is called Maybe. Uh, so, so I was just reading one of the messages then. Um, so let's finally explore a theory that maybe none of you watching this tonight have even thought about, but it's a theory that over the past few years has been gaining some serious traction. We're veering away from the grim idea that the boys met their end in the tower. Instead, let's picture this. They might have slipped through the cracks, escaped and lived out their days like any other folk. This isn't just a fanciful notion. It's starting to look more plausible, especially with some recent developments. Now, the most famous claimant to one of the prince's identities was Perkin Warbeck, who stirred up quite a storm back in the day by claiming... He was the younger prince. But fast forward to now, and historian detective John Dyke is stirring the pot again, and he's convinced he's tracked down the real Edward V, a guy who lived under the radar in, in uh, Devon, going by the name of John Evans. Now the juicy part is John Dyke's evidence. He's been poking around in St Matthew's Church in Coldridge in Devon for four years, hunting for connections to the eldest prince, Edward V. Now this place is practically a Yorkish treasure trove. You've got the Rose of York, the Sun in Splendour, and even a figure decked out in royal ermine and toting a crown thought to be Edward V himself. This isn't totally out of left field. The church was on land owned by Thomas Gray, Elizabeth Woodville's son, from another marriage and Edward V's half-brother. But Dyke thinks there's more to it. Maybe these Yorkish symbols were a nod not just to the cause, but to Edward V himself. So let's rewind to March 1484. Elizabeth Woodville cuts a deal with Richard and tells her son to head back home because Richard's giving him the all clear. Part of this deal might have been about keeping her boys safe and out of the succession squabble. But Dyke thinks even the name John Evans is a clue. On his tomb, there's the inscription E-V-A-S or Evas Evas, however you want to pronounce it. But if you break it down, it could be pointing to Edward V as the EV and ASA, that's Latin for sanctuary. 
So what if the reason we haven't solved the prince's murder is because there was no murder to begin with? It's a wild twist in a centuries-old saga, and it's got us all questioning what we thought we knew. So could the princes have actually survived and lived hidden in plain sight? Who knows? But I'm guessing it will all come come through eventually. Um, what else have we got coming through on the chat? Who profits, who profits most from their disappearance? It's a good question. Uh, and um, I guess, I guess Richard does. Uh, sorry, not Richard. Um, Henry Tudor. I guess Henry Tudor profits most from them uh, not not uh, coming through uh, into adulthood, and that is why Henry Tudor was uh, connected uh, to uh, as a possible uh, assailant uh, to their their murders. Um, finally, then tonight, I'll let you. Uh, is there anything you want to add? Have you got any theories or anything? I'll let you uh, add something on there. Uh, finally tonight, this mystery has been boggling minds for ages. And honestly, it's starting to look like we might never crack it wide open. But hold on, because as always, there is a twist. And with forensic technology getting better and better, we're edging closer to possibly, well, just maybe, uncovering the truth. The whole saga really shows just how powerful our collective imagination can be. For centuries, people have been digging, theorising and pouring resources into unravelling what really happened to those young princes. It's like an historical detective story that has captivated us generation after generation. But here's the thing, this story isn't, end, isn't ready to end just yet. With each technological advance and new discovery, we get a little bit closer to piecing together this century's old puzzle. So stay tuned, the mystery of the princes in the tower continues, and who knows, we might just be on the brink of a breakthrough. So let's keep the conversation going and see where this journey into the past takes us. And that, ladies and gents, is my little talk for tonight on the princes in the tower. <coughs> Excuse me. So, anybody uh, had a change of mind? Does everybody still think it's Richard? I should have put a poll up, actually. Did uh, anybody think it's uh, Henry Tudor or Margaret Beaufort or anybody else? Grace says, uh, I think David Starkey disputed this. Good theory. And I believe Richard had too much to lose if they weren't dead. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Nothing else coming through on there, message wise. Anybody got any suggestions who they thought it was? Perman, Richard did it. I'm guessing that's what that says. Why didn't Richard say he didn't kill them? And that's the that's a, a, quite a good point actually, Perman, because like that last part of the talk. Basically, from the uh, the guy in Devon who's been doing that uh, that work down there, uh, were they even murdered? I mean, this is the these are new questions that are coming to light. But it, that kind of example that he's uh, looking into and that theory that he's looking into um, is um, is bringing about. Uh, new thoughts into people's heads and minds and people are starting to think differently. Were they actually murdered? Because the bodies that have been found, and unless DNA is done on the bodies that were found in, um, uh, the, well, there's two now in Westminster Abbey and the other two are in St. George's Chapel. Unless DNA is done, there's never going to be any uh, any proof in that respect. If they came back after DNA was done and there was nothing there, then obviously, yeah, you'd, You'd be looking at John Dyke's uh, explanation as to what possibly happened, and maybe they didn't get murdered. Maybe some deal was agreed, uh, and they were just set free, and they went to live normal lives, and that was it. Uh, Anna May, I think Buckingham did it, or had done it. Could have done. Maybe, maybe Buckingham did do it. I mean, he had, um, obviously, wanted uh, a little bit of power himself, and uh, who knows what went off. It's... Just completely different times in those days. Just like I don't think any of us today can imagine 
how a different life it was in those days. It was just completely, you know, just well. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no. Um, oh, James just said. <laughs> I think they survived living on a tropical island. Yeah, they may may well be. Who knows? Might have been. They might have become pirates or something and uh, gone off to fight. I don't know. Who knows? Exactly, Elizabeth. Yeah, there's bones there, but it's not definitive that the two princes uh, that they're the two princes, and we have to wait until uh, to see what the future holds. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this down. How long we've we been going? We've been going forty five minutes. Stay with me for two or three more minutes and uh, I think you'll enjoy the last little bit. Medieval. I've always thought Richard was the main suspect, but I might be wrong. We don't know. We don't know. That's quite right. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. And Elizabeth, we've seen that one. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I don't know how many we've got on here. 27, is it? Until next time, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit that like button. Uh, and even become a courtier or crown yourself as royalty in our members area. There's so much on offer. And so remember, if you love history, you'll love History Roadshow. My name is John. Thank you all so much for watching this tonight. And I think, for your little surprise, it's only fitting that the last word should go to King Richard himself. Good night. As your sovereign, I stand wrongfully accused of a heinous deed against my own blood. The claim that I, Richard III, would extinguish the innocent lives of the princes in the tower is not only baseless, but against the very grain of my being. I was a protector, not a usurper of my kin. My ascent to the throne was not paved by treachery, but necessitated by the realm's need for stable governance. Those boys were my nephews, the sons of my beloved brother. To harm them would be to betray my own flesh and blood and the sacred trust bestowed upon me. It is anathema to my character and to the values I hold dear. Let it be known, my conscience is clear, and history shall judge me not as a murderer, but as a guardian wrongly maligned.